Hi everyone, this is the Brosis Effect. No, it's not. It totally is. My name is Nicole. This is Michael. No, we're not. And we are going <laughs> to watch the film theory, well, the first film theory of Salad Fingers. It is called The Horrific Story of Salad Fingers. So we have watched and reacted to all 11 episodes. Make sure to check them out. Um, and now we'd like to watch the film theories and kind of see if there's more to this, if we were right about anything, if there's anything we didn't know, which I'm sure there's a lot. Yes, sir. And we're just going to jump right in. Cool, let's do it. If you thought Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was the most disturbing stuff on YouTube, think again. Ain't that right, Salad Fingers? Hubert Cumberdale. Fancy seeing you here. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, giving myself nightmares just to explain a decades-old web series. And that's no exaggeration, I have been wrecked for a week working on this thing. But man, what a rewarding series it is to analyze. So as we prepare to hop right in, let's start with some context. Starting in 2004 and finally ending in 2013 with just 10 short episodes, Salad Fingers was successfully able to terrify a generation, making it one of the founding fathers of online online video this is terror. Only about the I kid you not. I remember episodes. being in high school and everyone daring each other to watch the first episode of this. The next day, kids would come back wrecked. I'll admit it, the build up for how scary this thing was was this. so strong that I actually didn't watch it. Only just picking it up this year to finally satisfy my curiosity, thinking, hey, I've grown up a bit, this shouldn't be nearly as scary as it was when we were back in high school. But I was definitely wrong. Freakish imagery, gut-wrenching sound design, and an unsettling story, all packaged and stiff, inhuman animations in the way only early Flash videos can animate, it was, and still is, the stuff of nightmares. Yet despite its obvious scare factor, what's less obvious is the series' plot. With so much of the story being told in fractured pieces by unreliable characters using abstract symbols, what's actually going on here is a bit of a question. The visuals and sound may be the stuff of nightmares, but the story here is the stuff of theories. Which means after all of these years of avoiding watching it myself, it's now my turn to dare you to watch the Salad Fingers series if you haven't yet. And if you think you can handle it, by clicking right here. It's a little under an hour and it's well worth it to not only understand this theory, but witness some of the most influential early Flash animations online. Plus, with Halloween around the corner, it'll give you some spooky fun. All right, ready to toss some salad? Let's go. Now, when trying to analyze something as abstract as salad fingers, we have to start with the most basic questions and work from there. So where is this story set? Well, we see salad fingers roaming a mostly barren wasteland filled with strange mutants and burned out houses, leading many to think Think that this is a post-apocalyptic universe. However, based on context clues, we can get a lot more specific. When discussing his earlier life, Salad Finger says, I used to sing at all the functions, from Croxley Heath to Cowden Beath. Both of which are real-world locations in the United Kingdom. He mentions Croxley again, this time saying that he listened to it on the radio in episode 8. If I'm an early bird, I listen to Croxley. So we know that he lives in the UK, but we can also identify the year. In episode 6, Present, the titular present that he receives is a toy horse that he refers to as... My very own. Horace Horse Collar. Notice that he says, my very own Horace Horse Collar, meaning that Horace Horse Collar is already something in existence. And indeed he is. Horace Horse Collar was the name of a cheerful, know-it-all cartoon character created by Walt Disney back in 1929 as a partner to Mickey Mouse in all of his adventures. Basically, he was like the earlier version of Goofy, appearing in animations between 1929 and 1942. But we can narrow that range further as we hear Salad Fingers sing both the songs Somewhere Over the Rainbow and We'll Meet Again at various points throughout the series. Two songs, both released in 1939. And 1939 is a crucial year since it falls right between World War I and the start of World War II. Throughout Salad Fingers, our leafy green hero talks frequently about the Great War. Back from the Great War? To leave for the Great War without me. With various characters coming back from the war, including Kenneth, his younger brother who happens to be a corpse lying in a ditch, and Jeremy Fisher, one of his finger puppets. More on both 
both of them a little bit later. Salad also laments that Kenneth must return to the trenches, the major fighting style of the First World War. It's also worth remembering that in between the two wars, no one called it World War One, since no one knew a second one was coming just a few decades later. As such, while the US referred to it as the European War during those years, Britons preferred calling it the Great War. At least they did up until the 1940s. Based on all of this evidence, we know that Salad Fingers is set in a version of the UK in 1939, one still grappling with the very real effects of the First World War, but right before the outbreak of the second one. Who said a weird web series about rubbing rust-covered objects with your grotesque leaf fingers wouldn't be educational? And here's where it gets interesting, because remember, based on Horace Horace Collar and the two songs he sings, the time we spend with Salad Fingers is at least 1939, which is 20 years after the end of the Great War. And yet he talks about it like it's still going on. He's delusional, mentally stuck in the past. It's also important to note that we see background paintings of normal people and places, like the one in episode no, one, as well as this one of a church in episode five. From flashbacks, we can see that Salad Fingers has experienced things like hair salons, so there is a real world here. A real world filled with actual normal looking people like the kid in episode two, and his picnic partner in episode five. In short, the post-apocalyptic wasteland filled with irradiated mutants that Salad Fingers wanders through is not reality, as many other theories believe. It's how he sees the world. Very clearly, there was a moment in his life during the Great War that caused him to have a break from the existing reality, and he's entered a state of arrested development ever since. Which means that things start to get complicated in a hurry, because not only is he lost in time, but his personality is also jumbled. While it would be easy to lump all of Salad Fingers' actions onto one person, he actually shows himself to hop between various characters and backstories without realizing it. For instance, when speaking with Kenneth, he laments being left behind as the rest of the boys went out to the Great War. It was frightfully rude of you blokes to leave for the Great War without me. But then two episodes later, we see him writing the equivalent of a teacher's note explaining why he can't come to the front today, implying that he's already been there. I shan't be able to attend the war today. Not to mention him speaking fluent French. Nabila. In understanding Morse code, both skills a soldier would likely have from his time during the war, but made especially stranger since he shows that he can neither read nor write, as evidenced by his failed letter writing in episode 9, his made-up letter reading earlier in that same episode, and his willful disregard for Harry the Barbecue Man's name tag in episode 2, instead choosing to name him Milford Cubicle. And then joyfully play the flute for him. <laughs> like I said, this series is so weird. We also clearly see him giving voice to his own baby. Ah, that's a shame. You were doing a first-rate job. And repeatedly slipping into the persona of a flirtatious girl, hitting on sailors back for shore leave. There'll be trouble in the maiden's quarters. M maybe you can come and tuck me in tonight. Oh, that was Sailor. flirting? Stop that. Talking about washing his petticoat. Probably enough water in here to wash oh, my he petticoat. Which is a girl's underskirt, just so you know. Not many of the beauty gurus talking about their petticoats these days. And also repeatedly hopping into dresses, whether to sing on stage or get himself married. Then, in the final episode, he enters the forest, hoping to find a doctor to look at Milford Cubicle, who, yes, just so happens to wind up as a corpse hanging from the wall. We've a duty to fetch the doctor since our wandering guest has fallen ill. And once the doctor is found, claims the examination for himself. I suppose you'll be checking me. We also see moments where Salad Fingers clearly switches from one persona to the next, forgetting the name of one of his favorite puppets, Hubert They're Cumberdale, bothering. and having to make up a new one. Why, if it isn't, um, but Barbara. Logan Price. Forgetting that he intended to give his baby away to Auntie Bainbridge and deciding to clean the windows instead. Good old Auntie Bainbridge has agreed to take care of you. I'm just here to clean your window. And with a clear change in attitude indicated by his facial shift as the doctor brutalizes the horse during the final scenes of episode 10. I, I know it hurts. 
In short, solving the story of Salad Fingers isn't just figuring out what's going on for one character, it's figuring out the numerous people Fingers gives voice to, decoding what they're saying, and then deciding how those actions all fit into one overall narrative. And that's quite a monumental task, so let's actually start with one of the easiest of those characters, which is his younger brother Kenneth. In episode 7, labeled Shore Leave, the puppet Hubert Cumberdale digs up a dead body, who Salad Fingers identifies as his brother, back on leave from the Great War. Already you can see how Salad here is a little bit of a tossed salad, as he attributes the digging of the hole to Hubert, a finger puppet, rather than himself, giving us further evidence that he switches between personalities, blacking out what happens in those moments from his own memories. Now, during his brother's visit, Salad marvels at the women his brother must have chased, recounts details of his own personal singing career, and then ends the visit by kicking Kenneth back into the hole so he can return to the trenches and resume his call of duty. It's about as pleasant of a visit as you can expect from a half-desiccated corpse. Except, there's one flashback in the middle of that visit that's awfully suspicious. Salad Fingers leads into the flashback by telling a story of how he and his brother used to frolicking by the riverside. We then hear a typical flashback transition, and what we see instead is our green friend rolling out a measuring wheel and talking to a tree. 21 yards from the front door today. Not quite frolicking by the river with his brother, right? Well, maybe it is. What if his brother is the tree? Or more accurately, what if his brother is buried under the tree? I propose to you that the younger brother, Kenneth, never fought in the war at all, and instead died young, perhaps even in childbirth, only to be buried under this tree 21 yards away from Salad Finger's front door. And beyond just the obvious flashback, there are smaller oh, clues yeah, to this being funny. the true story. First, mm -hmm. notice that the episode is labeled short, like and yet Salad Finger says Kenneth is headed back to the trenches. As a member of the U.S. Royal Navy, him, Kenneth yeah. shouldn't be dealing with trenches, as his battles would be mostly fought theory. at sea. So either it's a factual error here, or a fabricated memory by Salad Fingers dreaming up his dead younger brother as some sort of war hero getting all the ladies. But that's not all. Let's look at the tree itself. You see, this wouldn't be the only time that we see this tree associated with babies. During a dream sequence Daddy. at the top of episode 9, Salad Fingers has a conversation with that same tree, which now sprouts a face and complains about wanting to come inside to escape the cold. The difference, though, is that this time the tree calls him Daddy. I'm cold out here, Daddy. I'm cold. And when Salad Fingers refuses to help Mr. Branches, saying that the baby needs to grow out of its branches to come inside, it wraps itself around its stomach, ending the dream and leading to a scene where Fingers actually gives birth. In fact, when you look across all ten of Salad Fingers episodes, baby imagery is everywhere. From Salad Fingers finding a baby yeah, carriage like, for his nettles kids? and starting to lactate in episode 3, to him being attacked by the baby tree and literally giving birth in episode 9. But probably the clearest place that we see it is in episode 4, Cage, where Salad Fingers is literally followed around by an embryo. And that's no exaggeration, just look at this thing. The large folded over forehead, oh. the veins visible under the skin, it looks exactly like a baby in the womb. It even makes baby noises throughout the episode. <laughs> But the giveaway here is in the eyes. Salad Fingers may be abstract in its art style, but it's not sloppy with its imagery. Pay careful attention to the eyes of the characters who appear throughout the series. The living characters, like Salad Fingers, Auntie Bainbridge, Varsity Jacket Kid, and Milford Cubicle prior to his death, all have normal looking eyes. The puppets all have button-like eyes. And this guy is the only one to have misshapen black dots, just like the eyes of a developing embryo. I mean, just compare the two. Look at an embryo, Look at this character. They are one and the same. But what does it all mean? Well, in Cage, we see Salad clearly disturbed by this thing following him around. He starts the episode eager to find France because, as he says, I've always wanted to go there. But once he realizes he's being chased by the embryo, he immediately puts off his goal for another day, returning home to hide. And it's not like this thing is menacing. Quite the contrary, he's actually incredibly friendly, with hearts appearing around it when it speaks to Salad Fingers and proposing to him with a ring. Sure, it also lures him out of the house with a grubby tap, leading him to a bear trap and locking him into that titular cage, but hey, it was for love, 
I swear, I did it all for love. The episode ends with Salad disappearing, flying away on a tap, once again wearing his beret to find France, while the embryo sits there and cries. It's a bizarre sequence, but also one that seems pretty literal. Between this and the tree, it's the second time that we see Salad Fingers actively walking away from babies looking for affection. In fact, the presence of the baby prevents Salad Fingers from pursuing his dream of finding France and literally traps him, which shows how Salad's psyche views having kids. It's a metaphor that continues in episode 9, where having baby Yvonne starts as a happy moment, but then quickly turns sour as the baby doesn't listen to him, and instead slowly starts to kill him, to the point that the enfeebled Salad Fingers is stuck in a wheelchair and decides to give her away. Time and time again throughout this series, we see Salad Fingers turning away from children, running away from them, trapped the by them, and in some instances, <laughs> outright killing them, yes. as is the case with the boy that he accidentally locks in the oven. One of the yes, few events in the series that we can actually confirm firm is a real occurrence since we see the letter from his letterman jacket buried in a pile of junk midway through the final episode. But what does it all mean? Mm -hmm. Well at this point we've covered about half the episodes, meaning that there's still quite a bit to go, and the hardest questions are yet to come including the identities of his mysterious finger puppets and the super dark imagery of the final ending. So I know you're gonna hate me for it, but I have to call this one a two part. So theory, right? So there were some things that I didn't see that way, and there were some things I think Ugh. are reaching, but then as he kept going, I'm like, okay, I, I it guess. It makes sense. It's just like when you first heard it, then I was like, where did yeah, that come from? Yeah, I mean, but... and we don't know. Obviously, only the creator really knows his intent, but I, I think... I think he's probably got it pretty close I would have on. never looked up Croxley Heath and tried to figure out well, what, what year based they... on the song. So that was good information that we didn't have to waste our time looking for. Do so you it, think he's? it's all in his head, or do you still think it's a apocalyptic world he's in. I think it's in his head. He's post-traumatic stress disorder from something. Something's, it's in. A, it's all in his head, and I agree. That would make sense. I think it's all fake because the reason is because half the things you could tell are fake, like a radio that's not plugged in is making noise. It's and all in its head. And... It's not even plugged in. Things he's seeing, like... The puppets doing the things they can. Yeah. So you think he really it's... killed that boy? Yeah, uh, probably. It's a psychotic guy. We did know. We were always saying, why is there always children? What is with the children? This is creepy. So we're not crazy with that. There really was, like, something child-related in almost all the episodes. Oh, yeah. I thought that was enlightening. I uh, hope you liked our reaction to this film theory. Uh, if you have any other videos you'd like us to react to, please leave them in the comments and make sure to subscribe. Do it. You won't. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>